Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Not a Moment to Waste, the battle for a working country on a working planet, a conversation with Bill McKibben, the OG, presented by the New England Aquarium Lecture Series. I'm Vicki Spruill. I'm the president and CEO of the New England Aquarium. The Aquarium is a nonprofit research and conservation organization that has protected and cared for our ocean and its animals for more than 50 years, actually 54 to be exact. We're delighted to be hosting this talk and grateful to the Lowell Institute for their generous support, which allows us to offer its lecture series free of charge. This is also a very special moment for me, as I have admired and been inspired by Bill McKibben since reading The End of Nature a long time ago. It's an honor to be introducing Bill McKibben. He shares our passion for protecting our blue planet and is here to talk about his experiences as an author, as an educator, and as an environmental campaigner. Bill McKibben is a contributing writer to The New Yorker and authored his first book in 1989. Titled The End of Nature, it was one of the first books written for the general public on the topic of climate change, and oh, was he prescient. In addition to his prolific writing, Bill helped pioneer a worldwide climate movement as a founding member of 350.org, the first global grassroots climate campaign. Since 2009 and under Bill's leadership, 350.org activists have in initiated international days of action across the globe, pipeline protests in the United States, fossil fuel divestitures totaling $12 trillion from universities, foundations, cities, and churches, and an end to fracking in cities throughout Brazil and Argentina. In 2021, Bill helped found Third Act for people aged 60 and older to build a progressive organizing movement on behalf of the climate movement and social justice. Third Act engages with older Americans, the fastest growing segment of our population, by the way, with 10,000 people in the US turning 60 years old every day to use their resources, their skills, and experience to help strengthen our democracy and stall climate change. Third Act's most recent protest took place across the US on March 21st and called on our nation's four largest banks to stop funding new fossil fuel infrastructure or risk losing the patronage of older Americans. Dubbed a rocking chair rebellion by the New York Times, it was the largest ever climate protest organized by and for older Americans. Bill joins us tonight to share more about Third Act and to discuss his recent book, The Flag, The Cross, and The Station Wagon, a graying America a graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and, un and wonders what the hell happened. <laughs> In addition to his prolific writing and activism, Bill is the Schumann Distinguished Professor in Residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. He holds honorary degrees from 19 colleges and universities and has been recognized with numerous awards and honors, including the Wright Livelihood Prize, sometimes called an alternative Nobel in the Swedish parliament for his work mobilizing worldwide popular support to counter climate change. I also must mention his Massachusetts connection. He spent his younger years growing up in nearby Lexington and visiting the aquarium. It is my great honor to welcome one of the leading environmental activists of our time, Bill McKibben. Thank you very thank you. much. Okay. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here, even with that giant face looming over my shoulder, I must say. It's a little. Um, uh, it really is fun to be at the aquarium. I started coming here when I was nine, uh, and I remember it extraordinarily well. Um, 
I remember when I was 10 or 11, they had an election for the mayor of the aquarium. And I was a big partisan of Hoover the Harbor Seal, who I believe won the mayoralty uh, early on. So I remember telling um, uh, Mayor Wu when I first met her that I, I knew some other mayors in Boston before her. So it was, um, um, it was a remarkable place then and is now. And, and of course, Boston Harbor was and is a remarkable place. I was, a, as a boy growing up, a Sea Scout. We had a 45-foot Navy Air Sea rescue boat uh, that we would take out almost every weekend out to George's Island or out fishing for flounder or whatever it was and got to know these waters pretty well. Um, and I miss them. At some point in my life, I had to kind of make the choice and the call of the mountains was just too much for me. I love the high country and the smell of pine needles baking in the summer sun and things. So I've lived my life up in the deep woods in the Adirondacks and now in the Green Mountains. But my brother um, uh, uh, stuck with the ocean and ended up um, first teaching school on Matinicus Island, the furthest island out in Penobscot Bay, and now he's the stern man on the lobster boat um, out there. And so I get my fix once in a while visiting Tom, but it really is always the sense that um, of a, 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 a different and, and choice and one that one uh, misses a little bit, just the um, not being able to be in all the beautiful places on this planet. So that's why it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. And truthfully, it's probably more of a pleasure for me than it is for you because um, one of my jobs in the world is just to be a professional bummer outer of people. And <laughs> I'm gonna do that for a moment um, because we need to understand kind of where we are um, if we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do to get out of the fix we're in. Um, the scale and the pace of the solution depends on the scale and the pace of the problem that we face. And I'm fear that the problem we face, its scale and pace gets more dire and dramatic pretty much every week now. Um, I'm just gonna talk as I begin here about the oceans um, because we're at the aquarium, but also because, well, because if we named the planet honestly, we probably wouldn't have called it Earth. We probably would have called it ocean because um, that's mostly what it is. And, and the, news is, the news is not good. Um, two weeks ago, the day that Trump was indicted um, and every journalist in the country was covering that story, the real story, the one that in a hundred years people will remember, was a new paper that came out that morning in um, Nature. And what it demonstrated was something we'd long feared but hadn't had the evidence for yet, which was that there was now enough water, fresh water pouring off the melting Antarctic continent that it was beginning to dramatically interfere with the salinity and hence density of the water in the Southern Ocean. And of course, it's that salinity and density that drives the deep ocean currents. The water is not heavy enough to be pressing down as efficiently in order to start that great conveyor belt. And the uh, Antarctic overturning current is one of the two of these great currents in the world. The other one, the Atlantic meridional overturning current, the same thing is happening as water pours off Greenland. We'd known that for a few years. We'd had better data, but the Southern Ocean's hard to study, but it's, people are getting better at studying it. And the numbers were really dire. Um, the estimate from these papers was that we could see that current drop by 40% by 2050. Um, and if anything, and, and it's already starting to happen, and if anything like that happens, I mean, that's what pushes the great nutrient cycle out around the ocean. It's what spreads heat around. It affects uh, uh, pretty much everything. These are two, the, those two currents are two of the biggest physical features on our planet. 
um, the, uh, the Atlantic Current, the, of which the Gulf Stream is a major component, is 100 times the flow of the Amazon. Um, um, and we've managed in very short order to monkey around with them in really difficult ways. We also learned last week uh, that ocean temperatures measured as a whole have set a new record. Uh, uh, they're the highest we've ever measured, beating by about a tenth of a degree the old record set in 2016. And that's particularly unsettling news because it comes at the end of three years of a La Nina current in the Pacific, a cooling current in the Pacific that tends to depress overall global temperature and to depress sea temperature. That La Nina episode is ending now, and the pretty increasingly firm prediction is that we're entering an El Nino phase this summer or this fall. That will almost certainly lead to a new global record air temperature. Um, in fact, if it's as strong El Nino as it looks like it may be, Jim Hansen, our greatest climatologist, has said that in 2024, the world is likely to go past at least temporarily that 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase that you've heard people talking about as a kind of barrier we do not wish to breach. So the point that I'm trying to make is that these things are happening very much in real time. Um, there's nothing, there's, th these are not threats uh, for, uh, these are the absolute day in, day out realities of the planet. Maybe show that video now if it's possible. This is just, this is taken off my cell phone. Um, I was in Greenland doing some work and we, uh, It'll take a minute to get to the good part. I, I was actually there to coordinate this remarkable project um, where we got a couple of poets up on the ice shelf in Greenland. A woman, a poet from the Marshall Islands in the Pacific, whose homeland is going to drown as Greenland melts. She gave an astonishing performance, but then we were leaving uh, and the helicopter and just happened to be going along the front of the ice sheet. Um, I'm not a very good photographer, and it's definitely was not intended to be uh, projected in quite this size. But um, you'll begin to see the front of the ice sheet there. That's just one of the you know endless glaciers in Greenland. If you go in a mile to there, you get onto the huge ice sheet. It's about two miles thick of ice. At that point, hitting the ocean, it's about 12 stories high, something like that. So I don't know how high the aquarium is. Probably about that sort of thing. So think about the same height and you know just as we came over um, in a minute, um, Now, on the one hand, that's extraordinarily beautiful. You know, those waves were 30 and 40 feet high, you know, the wash up, just the wind up was blowing the helicopter back and forth. And, and, and it was, I mean, I had the guys circle around just so we could watch it because it was a scene of extraordinary and primal beauty. Um, but that's happening now someplace on the planet, every second of every minute of every hour of every day, and every time it happens, the sea level rises another micron, you know? Um, um, and that's us, you know? That's what happens when you begin to dramatically warm the planet. When we talk about global warming, we sometimes Get, and we sometimes get confused by the uh, by the units that we use. We say, "Oh, we're going to raise the temperature 
one degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius, or we're on trajectory now to raise it three degrees Celsius. That doesn't sound like that much. Um, I mean, if it was, if the temp, if it's three degrees colder when we walk out here than when we walked in, we won't really notice. But the planet definitely notices. And if you think about it in other units, you begin to get a sense of, I mean, every day, the heat we trap near the Earth because of the carbon we've put in the air by burning coal and gas and oil, every day is the heat equivalent of 400,000 Hiroshima-sized explosions, okay? So when you think about it in those units, it's easier to understand how more than half of the sea ice in the summer Arctic is melted now. Easier to understand how we've managed to raise the level of the oceans a lot. And there was another study last week demonstrating that that sea rise is suddenly accelerating, especially around the southeastern US at really remarkable rates. Um, helps you understand how we've managed to discombobulate the whole hydrological cycle of the planet. If you wanted one thing to understand this century, you could do worse than warm air holds more water vapor than cold. That explains why in arid areas you get all this evaporation and then drought and then fire, and it explains why in places like we live, you get more and more and more rainstorms. The easiest people on earth to convince about the danger of climate change are people who run public works departments in New England, because they've spent the last 10 years systematically taking out all the 12 and 14 inch culverts and putting in 18 and 20 inch culverts because the old book doesn't work anymore. You know? um, but of course, in New England, at least for the moment, we have the money and the resources to adapt to one degree or another in ways like that. And that's not true in most of the world. Um, you saw maybe the pictures from Pakistan last autumn, uh, where they had the greatest rainstorm since Noah, uh, the kind of rain you can only have on a planet where you've raised the temperature. It started raining and it did not stop. Uh, there were parts of Pakistan that got 800% of their annual rainfall in three weeks. Okay. So people, you know, people live mostly in mud houses, which is great. It's a perfectly good, sensible form of architecture. It's worked for a long time, but it doesn't stand up to that. People's houses just melted away. 33 million people were displaced. That's everybody from Boston to Baltimore. You know? And the kicker, of course, is that the 200 million people in Pakistan have produced way less than 1% of all the CO2 in the atmosphere. The 300 million people in the US have produced more than 25% of all the CO2 in the atmosphere. We're 3% of the population, but 25% of the carbon dioxide. Um, and in a sense, that was the point, one of the points of this last book of mine, which was about many things, but when it was about the environment, it was about the debt that we owe. Um, because we've been, you know, those of us who've been privileged to live here uh, in, in, in this world, and especially in the kind of suburban or affluent parts of this country, have produced the single greatest puff of that CO2 that there ever was. Second was the industrialization of China, but even it doesn't compare with the amount of carbon that we managed to pour in, and it's all still up there. The, the CO2 that poured out of the tailpipe of my family's Plymouth Fury when I was getting my learner's permit at the age of 15 is still up in the atmosphere, trapping heat, driving those events, you know, uh, uh, making sure that, say, Somalia just went through its fifth straight rainy season with no rain. There's 20 million people there surviving, sort of, on emergency food aid because the water around that part of Africa, the ocean, is so hot now that it's just changed the weather patterns in remarkable ways. The average Somali has put one five hundredth as much carbon into the atmosphere as the average American. So those debts are very real and very palpable and very important. And um, 
and I should stop being so depressing for a little <laughs> while. So let me talk about somewhat more, somewhat, somewhat more hopeful um, vein for a minute. Then I'll go back to being a little harsh on y'all. Um, the good news is that we know in a way that we didn't even 10 years ago what we need to do about this. Uh, the engineers really did their job. They drove down the price of renewable energy so fast and so far, dropped 90% in the last decade, that someplace three or four years ago it crossed some invisible line where it became the cheapest form of energy on the planet. The cheapest way to produce power on our planet is now to point a sheet of glass at the sun, which is a remarkable breakthrough. Um, it allows us to imagine that in very short order, we could end the 700,000 year long human habit of setting things on fire, which served us really well. I mean, you know, we learned to cook food, so we got a big brain. We could move north and south from the equator. The anthropologists think that gathering around the campfire at night explained some of the social bonds that mark our species. When we got to the Industrial Revolution, it made us rich, it produced modernity. Uh, but now the costs are extraordinarily high. The existential it's not even a risk at this point. Uh, the existential damage that it is doing to human civilization in terms of climate, the nine million people a year, about one death in five that result from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel, those particulates that get in your lungs. If you've been to Delhi or Shanghai, you know what I'm talking about, but it happens here too. There are millions of cases of childhood asthma uh, uh, many of which end up crippling people for life or killing them. And it's, you know, who gets it? I mean, it's, you know, who gets to live next to the highway or next to the refinery or whatever it is. And then we've, of course, been reminded in the last year of the third reason that it would be nice to stop relying on burning stuff. Um, if you rely on commodities that are only found in a few places, the people who control those few places get way too much power. Uh, to wit, Vladimir Putin, who's used his oil and gas earnings to launch a land war in Europe, something we thought we had maybe gotten away from. So the possibility of that transition is really magnificent, you know? I mean, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, so I'm compelled to say that it was kind of the good Lord to hang a large ball of burning gas, 93 million miles away in the sky, and then give us the wit to figure out how to make full use of it. I mean, we can catch its rays on pan photovoltaic panels, and we can take advantage of the fact that it differentially heats the earth, producing the wind that turns those turbines. That's, I mean, that's Hogwarts scale magic, you know? And if we were smart, this would be the thing that we would be devoting ourselves to as a species for the next decade or two, just doing this as fast as we possibly could to try and catch up with the physics of climate change. So the interesting question, one interesting question is, why aren't we? Um, why isn't that our all out? Why are we going too slowly? We're starting to do it. You saw the news today that the Biden administration had put in new rules for cars and trucks, and that's good. That's a start. You know, it gets us where we're going, but we, it's very clear too that we have not gone all out to make this happen. And part of the reason is inertia, which is always a force in human affairs. Um, you know, um, um, it just is. When was the last time you got down and uh, cleaned out the dust from under your refrigerator, even though if you did, it becomes a much more efficient device, you know? Um, we tend not to think about things, but that's not a crippling problem. The crippling problem is the toxic vested interest that has for 30 years, 35 years, kept us from doing what we should about climate change. I mean, I wrote the first book about this in 1989, and we knew everything then basically that we know now. It's not like there's been some set of surprises. We understood what was going on, but we didn't do anything because now we know from great investigative reporting that the oil companies knew everything that I knew 
back then in the 1980s. When I was researching that book and when Jim Hansen was producing his first papers, their scientists were hard at work studying this too. And they gave their executives all the data that there was. They gave incredibly accurate forecasts of what the temperature and the CO2 concentration would be in 2020. They were spot on and they were believed. You know, Exxon's executives took that data and started building all their drilling rigs higher because they knew the sea level was going to go up. They started plotting out precisely what parts of the Arctic they were going to drill once it melted in 15 years. The only thing they didn't do was tell the rest of us. Um, instead, they spent across the industry billions of dollars building this architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation. Um, that kept us locked for 35 years in a completely sterile debate over whether or not global warming was real. A debate, remember, that both sides knew the answer to at the beginning. It's just one of them was willing to lie about it. And it turns out to be the most consequential lie that we've ever dealt with because it cost us the one thing we can't get back, which is time. Um, that's why we have to somehow, the scientists tell us, cut emissions in half by 2030, which by my watch is six years and seven months away. That's a lot harder than doing it in 36 years, which is what we would have had had we gotten to work when we first knew what was going on. But it's not as if they've stopped, you know. They've changed because you no longer can get away with just straight out climate denial. Uh, there's too many forest fires and too many hurricanes and too many whatever. But you can switch your tactic to a kind of slow walking climate delay strategy designed to keep your um, business model intact for as long as possible. Because remember, if you're someone like Exxon, the idea that the sun, when it rose every morning, would deliver your energy for free is just the stupidest business model anybody ever thought of, you know? Because for a hundred years, you've prospered by making everybody write a check every month for their next delivery of this. And, and so you put your lobbyists to work, making sure that things, if they change, change very, very slowly indeed. And that's where we are right now with this kind of, uh, endless, among other things, endless games of pretend going on. We call them greenwashing sometimes. You may have, just not to pick on Exxon, I could do it with a lot of other people too, but if you've been watching TV the last 10 years, you'd be excused for thinking that Exxon was an algae company that happened to have a few oil wells on the side, you know. Um, they never put more than about two tenths of 1% of their research budget into algae anyway, and kept 99 whatever percent devoted to hydrocarbons. But then last year, they just, or last month, they just said, forget it, we're not gonna do the algae after all, you know? I mean, it, it doesn't work or whatever. Um, that kind of delay is completely insidious because this is a time-limited problem. So what do we do about it? That's really what I've, I've rambled on too long already, but let me just try quickly to say what we do about it. What we do, what we have to do, is build movements big enough to challenge the power of those guys and make this process happen faster, catalyze this reaction. That's what I've spent much of my life doing, though I don't really, I'm a writer, I don't really know how to do it. Um, we've been making it up as we go along, you know? You can tell I'm, a, I'm not a good public speaker, you know? Um, I, I, I'm happy to be here with you all, but I'd just as soon be home typing, you know? But, um, but I've sort of figured out what we've, and we've built, uh, we've built some big campaigns around the world that have been, powerful and interesting. We think we've organized about 20,000 demonstrations in every country on earth except North Korea. And some of this stuff we've won. You know, we blocked the Keystone Pipeline, thanks to everybody in here who worked on that. And we, you know, uh, and a lot of other, you know, most of that work, a lot of that work's been done by young people. They've been in the lead. 
When I started 350.org, it was with seven college students up at Middlebury. One of the things we did was this vast divestment campaign that Vicki was describing. And uh, 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 a lot of that took place on thousands of college campuses. And the kids who did it became good organizers. And when they got out of school, um, uh, they wanted to go on working. So they formed the Sunrise Movement, and they brought us the Green New Deal. Um, the wonderful, wonderful leader of the Sunrise Movement, Varshini Prakash from East Boston. Um, um, uh, and that, that's why we got this IRA bill, because they demanded $30 trillion in the Green New Deal. And after it had gone through Congress and Joe Manchin and everyone else, it was $300 billion, so 1%, but still far more money than we'd ever spent on this stuff before. It's a good lesson in there someplace about asking for a lot if you want to get anything. Um, um, they're fantastic. And then, of course, you know about the even younger people who got completely involved in this fight. You know Greta Thunberg, and you should. She's one of my favorite people to work with in the planet. I adore her. She'd be the first to say there are 10,000 Gretas around the planet, and there are, and I know a lot of them, and they have 10 million followers. That's how many kids were out on school strike in September of 2019 before the pandemic hit. They have completely done their job, as you would expect, <clears throat> because it's their neck on the line. You know, I'm going to be dead before the very worst of this all kicks in. But if you're, you know, in your teens or 20s now, whatever career you're training for, if we don't get this under control, your career is going to be disaster response because that's going to be everybody's career, you know. So it's a good thing that they're in the lead. But, but. I did hear one too many people say to me, I think, oh, it's up to the next generation to solve these problems, you know, which seems A, ignoble, and B, highly impractical, because for all their intelligence, energy, idealism, um, and it is a remarkable generation of young people, for all of that, they lack the structural power to make the change that we need in the time that we have. They need backup. As I started looking around to think who had that structural power, it did strike me that uh, people with hairlines like mine um, possessed a certain amount of it. There are 70 million people over the age of 60 in this. This is the part you're supposed to remember to tell your grandparents about, OK? Um, uh, 70 million people over the age of 60. Multiply that by some number because we all vote. There is no known way to stop old people from voting. Okay, um, And we ended up with most of the resources. We've got something like 70% of the country's financial assets compared to about 5% uh, for millennials. So if you want to push Washington, or you want to push Wall Street, or you want to push Beacon Hill, or you want to push City Hall, it's a good idea to have some older people. People have not tried organizing older Americans for progressive action in a while because the conventional wisdom is you become more conservative as you age. You may have heard that. Um, and maybe there's some truth to it. You get more stuff to protect or something. But actually, this generation of old people, I don't think it's true about at all. Because in our first act, we were around for that really remarkable, epic period of social, cultural, political transformation. The period when we started taking women seriously in public life, the apex of the civil rights movement, the first Earth Day in 1970 with 20 million people out in the street. I wager that there's people in this auditorium who were marching on that day in 1970. If you have any doubt about how Interesting that period was, by the way. Look at what the right-wing Supreme Court went after last summer in their rampage. The Civil Rights Act of 1965, the Gun Control Act of 1968, the Clean Air Act of 1970, and Roe v. Wade 1973. So people are starting to rally around to try and redress some of this. And just in time, because we really need it. Young people need that kind of backup. 
I'll describe just briefly this protest we did at the banks a couple of weeks ago, because those four big banks, Citi, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, are the four biggest lenders to the fossil fuel industry. They just keep the money flowing to those guys, even though every scientist now has told us that we have to stop, period, building new fossil fuel infrastructure. You know, we've got to wean ourselves off this stuff fast, and you can't do that if you keep just producing more of it, you know? Um, um, so we uh, 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 had demonstrations in about 100 cities all over the place. In uh, Juneau, they uh, built big credit cards out of wood and then cut them up with solar-powered chainsaws, you know? <laughs> and uh, um, I was in DC, uh, which was really wonderful. First, it was wonderful because you saw the new face of the environmental movement. Um, um, which is not happily as white as it has traditionally been. The new head of Greenpeace, a wonderful woman named Ebony Martin spoke, and then the new head of the Sierra Club, Ben Jealous, who used to be the head of the NAACP stood up and spoke. And that marriage of the civil rights movement and the environmental movement has the potential to be really strong, you know. But it was good because it was, you know, old, this, this sort of, somewhat non-threatening older people who had gotten everybody together, you know? It's hard to resist your grandparents when they ask you to do something, you know? And um, so we really leaned into it. We closed down all the banks for the day with a big sit-in, and the sit-in was conducted entirely in rocking chairs. Um, um, it was the most comfortable sit-in that I have ever engaged in, and I, it's how I'm going to do it from now on, because I am too old to sit sprawled across the pavement for hour on end. So um, um, it was really great, and it got huge coverage and, and started spreading this understanding that there's a deep link between cash and carbon. So let me just say, that debt that I was talking about in the beginning has to be paid and we have to be the ones that pay it, and we have to pay it by being willing to go outside of our comfort zone to one degree or another. You don't have to get arrested necessarily, though I meet a surprising number of people who inform me that this is on their bucket list and <laughs> ask if I can help, and I say that I usually can. But, um, um, but you do have to get outside your comfort zone because the planet is outside its comfort zone by a mile, that's what it means when the Antarctic current isn't flowing anymore. That's what it means when the Arctic is melting. Um, um, we did this uh, demonstration outside the banks in New York a few months ago. Did a big march between all the banks and um, there was hundreds of high school students there because there always are because they understand this in a sort of deeper, more visceral way than anybody else to the degree that a lot of them are quite anxious and depressed, which is not fair and not okay. But they were at the head of the march because they're somewhat spryer. But at the back, there was a big group of us with a banner that said fossils against fossil fuels, <laughs> you know. Um, um, so we're doing our best and in the right spirit to try and and well, to try and um, take seriously the idea about what the legacy means. It's not, I find myself understanding more and more, uh, some abstract thing. It is the world you leave behind for the people you love the most. And we are in danger of leaving behind a world that is shabbier than the one we found in very fundamental ways. And we need to stop that. And we can't. We do not lack the resources. One of the things that happened when we burned all that coal and gas and oil was that we got rich doing it. And there is enough money and enough resources in the global north to make sure that the whole world can do what needs doing in short order. But we have to actually do it. And so that's the task. Um, I really want to thank I know there's lots of people in this room who've already been engaged in that task, and I really want to say thank you, and I really want to say thank you for the work you'll do in the future ahead. I cannot guarantee you that we will win this fight because we do not know. It's not like other political fights because it comes with that time limit. 
And the news from the physical world really is difficult, difficult, difficult. But we know that if we don't engage, we will lose it badly. And we know that every tenth of a degree we can knock off of the eventual, um, of where the temperature eventually settles, will probably mean life for tens of millions of people and millions of other species all over this earth. So our job, it seems to me, is absolutely clear and thank you for being a part of it. So I have the great good fortune of moderating a QA and a session here. I seem to have my phone, so then I'll figure out something else. OK. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Thank you. That was um, remarkable. Um, is my mic on? Yes. And yeah, it was a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bummer. But I, I love the way you have helped us feel, or at least me feel, like we still have a shot. Like if we really put our minds together, we, we have a shot. So I'm, I'm feeling. Okay. Oh, I thought it was on. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Is that better? Woo! Okay. There you go. I was saying that was a bummer, <laughs> but um, I love the way you ended. At least I felt optimistic because we have some time. We don't have the time we could have had, but I'm just, I'm personally, having worked in conservation for the better part of my career, I'm sort of tired of thinking about all the things we didn't do. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's time for us to level set and look forward now to what can we do with the time we have mm -hmm. left. So that's, that's the spirit we certainly are taking on these issues, with which we are taking on these issues at the New England Aquarium. So my job is to field questions from the audience I'm guessing there are lots of them. And then we also have folks online, welcome, who uh, will also be asking questions. So let's start with the audience. And I will be repeating them because uh, we need to do that for the online folks. So straight up here in the back. Yeah. You, you, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. I just wanted to share Yeah. No, the acoustics are pretty good in here. Right. Absolutely. I could. So, Bill, the question is: um, Are there some specific targets Bill might offer for folks uh, like our questioner who is in rural Maine, who may not have a lot of time to go to DC? But what are some things that can be specific and focused? Right. So here's the thing. Um, and this is why I said at the beginning that the scale and the pace of the problem dictates the scale and the pace of the useful solutions. There's no point in uh, winning slowly on climate change is just a different way of losing. So, and at this point, the, um, though we all should be making individual changes and we know what most of those are, you know, um, we're past the point where we're going to solve this math problem one Tesla at a time, one vegan dinner at a time, whatever. Um, the most important thing an individual can do is join together with other individuals in movements large enough to matter. And at some, at some ways, the actual target that whatever group you're in is focused on is 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 important, but what's really important is that you're fighting this somehow or another in ways that are big enough and visible enough to make a difference because the real goal for activists when we fight pipelines, when we try to divest universities, when we you know go after pension funds, when we close down banks, whatever it is, 
All those individual fights are important, but what we're really trying to do is shift the zeitgeist around climate change. Shift people's sense of what's normal and natural and obvious um, to help make it easier for these big changes to happen. And we've gotten some part of the way there. The polling data is much better around climate change, and that's why Joe Biden was able to get the Inflation Reduction Act through by a single vote in our Congress. You know, if we hadn't done the work for the last 10 years, we wouldn't have done the political, laid the political ground to let that happen. So I guess my first advice is find some group of people, whether it's the local chapter of the Sierra Club or the local chapter of 350.org or the local working group of Third Act for the state of Maine or whatever it is, and get engaged with them because with 100 other people or 500 other people, you have enough noise to be heard above the sort of daily roar of things. I think at the moment, banks are actually a very good target for people to, because it turns out that the cash, the amount of carbon embedded in cash in the bank is really high. If you have, have $5,000 in one of those big banks, it gets lent out for uh, pipelines and frack wells and stuff, and that produces that $5,000 over the course of a year, more carbon than flying back and forth across the country. You know? And these guys could change and fairly easily. Exxon's gonna fight us to the last bridge because they only knew how to do one thing, dig stuff up and set it on fire. But Chase Bank, you know, they have a zillion people they can lend money to. Uh, they can take this hit and come out the other side. And if they had half a brain, they would because the economy is, turns out as a subset of the planet, not the other way around, though you wouldn't always think that from listening to uh, economists and politicians talk, you know? Um, so I think that's a very good target in large part because it's the one thing we can do in this country that has really big global impact. Um, these guys lend all over the world. You know, um, and we need to shut, I mean, they don't call it global warming for nothing. Um, so we need to be able to take these steps everywhere, and that's a good way. So Bill, we have a question from Maureen who says, if a person wants to send a message to those four big banks, mm -hmm. what's an effective way to do it if we're customers and if we're credit card users? Right. So again, unless you're extremely wealthy, it's possible that they might not notice that you closed your account. Um, um, because, you know, uh, Chase has 75 million credit cards. You probably have one in your pocket because if you have a Costco card or a United card or something like that, it comes from Chase or one of these big banks. Um, so you need to figure out how to do it. Don't, don't do this by yourself because it's spinning in the wind find other people to do it with in ways that are loud enough, to, again, to be heard and noticed. And the good news is there are you know, lots of other uh, banks and credit card providers and things like that. But our goal here is not to purify your life. Um, good if you do it, but um, you know, um, um, I'm not that much of a Methodist Sunday school teacher. Our, <laughs> Our job really is to try and, and change the policies of these big guys. So that, that's why we end up demonstrating outside them. You know, one of the things we did in this day of action was people figured out how to build cardboard smokestacks 20 foot tall uh, to go stand up next to these um, uh, banks because, uh, uh, you know, if you look at your basic Bank of America branch out in the strip mall, it doesn't look like it's pouring carbon into the air, but it is, and it should have a smokestack. Um, making that connection really matters. Um, so that's why we're going to keep doing this kind of stuff. They've helpfully picked out the 30,000 most highly trafficked retail locations across America to put their banks so you have no worries that you won't be seen if you're out there <laughs> making a fuss. And we will, many people will continue to. The next big chance is in a couple of weeks because they all have their big annual general meetings. So there'll be demonstrations outside, lots of shareholder groups voting their proxies, on and on and on. So keep an eye on that. And it's one of the things we're tracking at Third Act. 
How about another from the audience right here, straight up? Yeah. Yeah, you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, could he say a little bit more about money and politics? Yes, I'm a, I'm a good Vermonter. So, um, in fact, I got to introduce Bernie the day he announced for president in 2016. The three people who introduced him were uh, me and Ben and Jerry. Okay. <laughs> um, um, and, uh, uh, and it was great fun, to, and it you know been great fun, and he's been a great hero in uh, this work on the climate and in many other ways. And yes, money in politics is definitely at the bottom of a lot of this. The problem is that it's not immediately apparent how we're going to solve that quickly. And remember, quickly is part of the fight here. We may have to do it despite that because, you know, I mean, the Supreme Court is very much in the way when it comes to that. Um, and there don't seem to be easy ways to figure out how to get around that fast without having 60 senators in the Senate who want to do something about it. So that's the long run plan, but uh, six years is not a very long time. So I, I don't think we can wait for that to happen. I think we have to figure out other ways to push as we're going forward. It's one of the reasons why we go directly at these industries too and try to because our political system, yes, is badly broken, and that's and becomes you know more obvious every day we look at it. Uh, though I have, you know, I, though I was really upset with Biden about his approval of this big new Willow oil complex in Alaska, I do give him credit for every day trying to figure out how to make our political system work a little better or work at all, you know, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the other, the other thing we work on at Third Act is democracy. We work on, we say, the climate, climate, and the political climate. Because those are the two things that in the course of our lifetimes have changed the most and the most dramatically. You know, we knew that there was pollution, and that's why we passed the Clean Air Act, and the pollution, some of it, went away. We did not suspect that we were going to melt the poles. We knew that there was corruption because we lived through Watergate. But we did not suspect that, at least I did not suspect, that we would end up at a place where thousands of Americans would storm the nation's capital, killing police officers in order to stop the counting of votes. Um, that's a bad symptom of something breaking down. So it, that's why we work on these sort of twin axes all the time. And I, I, your question's a really good one. And um, Bernie, God bless him, just keeps ticking along, um, um, and it's very good to have at least one or two politicians where you know absolutely what they're going to say about every issue long before they say it, because they've said the same thing over and over. I want to reward folks who came in person, so let's take another right back there in the back on the aisle. Yeah, yeah it's you. No, I didn't say it wouldn't help. I said we couldn't solve it. One, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I do all the time. I wrote the forward this last year to a book called uh, Meet Me Halfway by a guy named Brian Cateman, who I actually think has come up with the, probably the best way to talk about this. He's started what he called the reducitarian movement to get people to cut in half or more the amount of meat that they were eating, which seems actually to work better than, um, I mean, so 
The reason that I think it's not going to solve it in the time that we have is that it's an enormous organizing challenge. About 2% of Americans, a little less than that, are vegans at the moment. Okay? So you could, it, I mean, you could have a huge organizing campaign to figure out how to increase that by an order of magnitude, get it up to 20%, which would be a, an enormous organizing challenge because bacon, you know. Um, um, and, and, um, um, and that'd be great, but it actually wouldn't dent that curve that much, you know. Um, uh, I think that if we're going to, I think that the weakness of industrial agriculture is in fact its reliance on uh, uh, carbon-based energy. And that if, for instance, we could get to the point where we could put a serious price on carbon, one of the very first things that ha would happen would be big shifts in how we uh, uh, farm and grow food, and we would probably get away a lot from beef. But it's a, but this reducetarian thing is a good idea, and I really you should check out this guy's book because I think it offers a way to talk about this without getting people's hackles up. Uh, in the way that sometimes happens when, um, um, when we, well, when this conversation goes on. It's called, it's a very clever title, it's called Meet Me Halfway, and you can <laughs> guess how meat is spelled in this. Okay, so I think this needs to be our last question. I'm looking at Suzanne for the cue, and we have one from Juliet. Uh, who says, how might we engage workers who may be afraid of losing jobs? How do we engage minorities clearly most affected by environmental injustice? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Bill. <laughs> well, so let's talk first about uh, engaging Black Americans and Latino Americans. Don't worry about it. Um, Every piece of polling data that we show that we have shows these are the people who are by far the most concerned in this country about climate change. Uh, and every bit of activism I'm engaged in, those are the, often the people who are in the lead with indigenous Americans often uh, and indigenous people all over the world uh, uh, in the lead as well. And the reason is obvious, people you know, are, are living far more with the lived reality of this Money for the moment remains a certain kind of insulation um, that you know provides you some shelter from all of this. And if you have less of it, then you're less insulated and more engaged. Um, how to engage workers is very important. And that's actually one of the very good things that's in this Inflation Reduction Act. And it's the genealogy, it's DNA comes from that Green New Deal. It's one of the parts that survived about 40% of the money that's supposed to be spent in that is supposed to go either to what they call environmental justice communities, people who've suffered the most from our current energy system, or what they call energy communities, places where people have had coal mines or whatever it is, um, and you get a much higher, five times higher tax credit for building a new solar farm or wind turbine place or something in where there used to be a coal mine. So it should push investment and jobs and resources in those directions if we manage to really make it work. And that will take some work because you all know enough about political reality to know that the, you know, in, left to its own devices, uh, political gravity uh, brings money to places where it already is, you know, um, and you have to make a very concerted effort to make sure that that doesn't happen. But to their great credit, the Biden administration's trying to do that. Um, and I do, this is like a good place to end because it just, the thing that I think makes people despair sometimes is the sense that, that they're alone in this fight or that there's too few people. Truthfully, this is an enormous movement now around the world. And I know this because I have been all over the world spewing carbon behind me to help build it um, over the years. And so I can tell you that if you are engaged in this fight, you have millions of brothers and sisters in every corner of the planet. And 
they, that is our uh, great hope that together somehow we can shift that global zeitgeist enough. Um, it is not easy. You know, I, the, we found out last week that the um, next big global climate conference is going to be held this fall in Abu Dhabi. And the guy who's going to chair it is also chair of the Abu Dhabi oil company. And, and we found out last week that they've announced plans now to uh, like double the size of their oil and gas extraction. I mean, there's a ludicrous aspect to this and it does get depressing sometimes. The only possibility to standing up to that is getting lots of people engaged and getting them engaged deeply enough that it makes a mark here. It's not the first time that people have had to do something hard, you know? If we'd been around, if you'd been around uh, uh, 80 years ago, 85 years ago on this planet, you know, the existential threat was fascism in Europe and people had to cross the Atlantic and kill or be killed in order to head it off. We do not have to do that. No one's asking anyone to do anything that hard. But we do need the same kind of focus and, and, and push, resolve, that marked that period. And if we can muster that, then we have a chance. And if we can't, then we will drift over this edge. And we will know in the lifetimes of pretty much everybody in this room, because it's not like far in the future, it is, it's, to go back to where I began, it is the daily reality now of the planet in which we lived. It's changing in real time, so we better change in real time into some kind of active mode. Here we go. Thank Al. you. Thank you so much for taking this hour with us. I also want to thank the Lowell Institute again who makes these lectures available to us. If you enjoyed this program and programs like this, I have to say it, I hope you will support the New England Aquarium at the Mission Forward Fund at the New England Aquarium. And we have Bill's newest book, The Flag, the Cross, and the Station Wagon for sale in the lobby. And we will have our cash bar open for another half hour. So please welcome us in the, welcome us in the lobby. Join us.